Here's an important application of our theory. Of course, this example is very interesting in its own right. The problem, we want to find the cyclotomic polynomials over the rationals. So these are the minimal polynomials of roots of unity over Q. Now, cyclotomic means circle cutting. So let's first note the connection between roots of unity and cutting up circles. We'll fix an integer n greater than or equal to one. Define omega as e to the two pi i over n. By Euler's formula, this is equal to cosine of two pi over n plus i sine of two pi over n. Now, omega is an nth root of unity, so it's a root of the polynomial x to the n minus one. And all other roots of this polynomial are in the form omega to an integer power. That's enough just to consider exponents between zero and n, including zero. If we sketch the nth roots of unity in the complex plane, they all live on the unit circle, and if n is greater than or equal to three, they're the vertices of a regular n-sided polygon. Two things to note. First, the nth roots of unity subdivide the unit circle into n equal pieces, so cyclotomic. Also, if we wish to study regular polygons, we have nth roots of unity available as a technique. Now, getting back to cyclotomic polynomials, okay, definition, the nth cyclotomic polynomial I denote as phi sub n. So this is the minimal polynomial of omega over the rationals. Recall, okay, what does minimal mean? If I have a non-zero polynomial f with rational coefficients and omega is a root of f, then we must have that phi sub n divides f. With the minimal property, phi sub n is irreducible over the rationals. If we're interested in field extensions, the degree of q adjoint omega over the rationals is equal to the degree of phi sub n. Now, we have omega as a root of unity. So it's a root of the polynomial x to the n minus one. And note, omega is not the root of any polynomial x to the d minus one with d less than n. So omega is a primitive nth root of unity. Now, definition, okay, we want to define primitive nth roots of unity. So first, our number has to be an nth root of unity. So we just need to consider omega to integer powers. So I'll say that omega to the k is a primitive nth root of unity. If omega to the k is not a root of any x to the d minus one, d less than n. Okay, we note it's enough just to consider d that are divisors of n. With this, okay, we see that to be a primitive nth root of unity, we just check to see if the greatest common divisor of k and n is equal to one. So k and n are relatively prime. With that, we can define the Euler totient function. We denote it by little phi. Phi of n is equal to the number of primitive nth roots of unity. That's the same as the number of integers k, k between one and n, including one, such that k and n are relatively prime. Now we can state our main results. First, the nth cyclotomic polynomial is irreducible over the rationals with degree phi of n. The coefficients of these polynomials are always integers. Then, if we want a formula for these polynomials, can we note that the roots are precisely the primitive nth roots of unity? So that gives the degree phi of n. Now, in practice, if we want to compute these polynomials explicitly, this isn't the best formula to use. Instead, we have the following amazing formula. So to compute the nth cyclotomic polynomial, what we'll do is take factors x to the d minus one raised to the mu n divided by d. So mu is the Mobius function. Then we take the product over all divisors d of n. Recall the Mobius function Okay, defined on the positive integers is equal to one when n is equal to one. n is a product of distinct primes. We take minus one to the number of those primes and zero otherwise. So mu of n is equal to zero if and only if n has a factor that's a square. We won't give a proof of this in this part, but we'll use it to generate examples. 
we start from scratch. So recall we have omega is a root of x to the n minus one. Because the nth cyclic atomic polynomial is the minimal polynomial of omega, this is gonna divide x to the n minus one. So let's check this with small n. If I let n be equal to one, two, or four, okay, we have omega one minus one and i. Five sub n in these cases are gonna be x minus one, x plus one, and x squared plus one. And these all divide the corresponding x to the n minus one. First, let's show that the coefficients are integers. This follows from Gauss's lemma. We have that five sub n divides x to the n minus one. So a factorization of x to the n minus one as five sub n times a polynomial with rational coefficients. Gauss's lemma says, we have a polynomial f with integer coefficients, that f factors over the rationals, if and only if f factors over the integers up to content. So here, the content counts as a genuine factor. Okay, the content is just the grace common divisor of the coefficients. Now, when we're in this case, okay, we have a factorization over the rationals. We get a factorization over the integers by using the same factors but we may need to rescale to get the coefficients in the integers. In our case, we have x to the n minus one. So the coefficients are integers, the content's equal to one, and phi sub n is monic. So in this case, there's no need to rescale. That means phi sub n has integer coefficients. And that's what we wanted to show. Next, let's find the roots of phi sub n. Let's suppose I have a root of phi sub n, say omega to the k, it's also a root of x to the d minus one. Because phi sub n is irreducible, phi sub n divides x to the d minus one. So all roots of phi sub n are roots of x to the d minus one. Now, this causes problems. We know that omega is not a root of x to the d minus one when d is less than n. So that means the roots of phi sub n are contained in the set of all primitive nth roots of unity. I want to show that these are all the roots. Now to do that, let's recall, if phi is algebraic over the rationals with minimal polynomial f sub alpha, I pick phi an automorphism of q adjoint alpha, then phi of alpha is also a root of f sub alpha. That means we should try to figure out automorphism group of q adjoint omega. Now we note here, on the rationals, okay, any automorphism sends the rational q to itself. To determine everything else, we just need to know where does phi send omega. Now our equations tell us, okay, phi omega raised to the nth power is equal to one, but I can't have that phi omega raised to the dth power is one for any d less than n. So that means phi on omega must be equal to a primitive nth root of unity. That means we're raising to the kth power where k and n are relatively prime. Let's denote the map with exponent k as phi sub k. Straightforward to show that this is a field automorphism. If we want to find the inverse of phi sub k, we appeal to Bazou's identity. Because grace common divisor of k and n is equal to one, there exists integers i and j, such that i times k plus j times n is equal to one. Then the inverse of phi sub k is just phi sub i. To check, we compose phi sub k with phi sub k inverse, apply it to omega. We have phi sub k on omega to the ith power, which is omega to the i kth power. If we substitute, we have omega to the one minus j n, which is just omega. So these maps are inverse to one another. That gives our main result, the roots of phi sub n are just the primitive nth roots of unity. One result we have that'll be useful later on, the automorphism group of the rationals adjoint omega is just the group of units in Z mod n under multiplication. Now, for some more properties of cyclotomic polynomials, okay, we can consider them as polynomials over the reals. If we have n greater than or equal to three, then the inverse of omega is just the complex conjugate of omega. That means, okay, these roots are gonna pair off 
and I could write phi sub n as a product of irreducible quadratics of this form. So x squared minus two cosine two pi k over n times x plus one. Now with this representation, easy to see, if we evaluate at zero, we always have that phi sub n of zero is equal to one, when n is greater than or equal to two. As an example, we let n be equal to three, then omega is equal to e to the two pi i over three, or minus a half plus square root of three over two i. Phi sub three on x is then x squared minus two cosine two pi thirds times x plus one. Because the cosine is equal to minus a half, we get x squared plus x plus one. And that's the same as x cubed minus one over x minus one. If we want to compute with larger n, we need some rules to simplify our work. So first we work with phi, the euler totient function. First property, we have that phi is multiplicative. So if m and n are relatively prime, then phi on m times n is equal to phi of m times phi of n. See this? We'll appeal to group theory. So first we need a straightforward result if I have R and S are rings, then to get the units in the product of R and S, I just take the units in R, cross with the units in S. With that, I consider Z mod MN star, the group of units in Z mod MN. Because M and N are relatively prime, we have that Z mod MN is isomorphic to Z mod M cross Z mod N. Then we use this result to pull this apart. So we have the group of units in Z mod M cross the group of units in Z mod N. Now we just count. So on this side, we have phi of MN. Here I have phi of M, here I have phi of N, and that's our result. Now, with that, it's enough just to compute phi on each power of a prime, and then we could just stitch everything together. So the rule here, P is a prime, phi on p to the k is just p to the k minus p to the k minus one. To see this, okay, we consider all elements under consideration. So we have one through p to the k, and we want to discard all multiples of p. So it's gonna be p times all elements, one, two, three, up through p to the k minus one. So you'll note, we multiply this one by p, that gets us to the p to the k, so I don't want anything larger than that. When we count, we get our result. Now, for examples, p is a prime, 5p is equal to p minus one. For a direct check, we note all integers between one and p relatively prime to p are just one through p minus one. So that checks out. For numerical examples, we take 510, so I could pull this apart as five two times five five. We compute each of these, so I get a one and a four, so we get four. I can see that directly by just checking one through 10, seeing which ones are relatively prime. So I get one, three, seven, and nine. For something a little larger, we could take five two hundred. So this is five eight times five twenty-five. And then using our rules, we get four times 20, which is 80. If we know the prime divisors of n, there's a quick formula for phi of n. We take n, we divide by each prime divisor, and then we multiply by each prime divisor minus one. This we get just by manipulating our formulas. For instance, 5, 200, the prime divisors are two and five. So we take 200, divide by two and five, multiply by two minus one and five minus one. This gives 80 as before. 572, the divisors are two and three. So we multiply by two minus one, three minus one, we divide, we get 24, and that we can check directly. Now, how about the second formula for the nth cyclotomic polynomial? To start, we know each root of unity is primitive for some d. So that means we can write the set of primitive nth roots of unity as a disjoint union of sets of primitive d roots of unity, where d ranges over the divisors of n. Now with that, we get two interesting formulas. First, 
n can be written as a sum of 5d, where d ranges over the divisors of n. So that's just counting the elements in each set. And we have a factorization for x to the n minus 1. So it's going to be a product of cyclotomic polynomials, where the indices range over all divisors of n. Now, with this formula, if we apply the Mobius inversion formula, we get formula 2. So 5n of x is equal to the product of okay, we have factors x to the d minus 1 raised to the mu n over d. And this product ranges over all divisors of n. Now, Mobius inversion we'll show in a separate video. For examples, we begin with p of prime. If I sub p has two factors, 1 minus x to the p and 1 minus x, for the exponents, 1 minus x to the p has exponent mu of p over p, or mu of 1, which is 1. 1 minus x has exponent mu of p over 1, or mu of p, which is a minus 1. So it goes in the denominator. We divide and we get 1 plus x plus x squared all the way up through x to the p minus 1. We've seen before that this is irreducible by Eisenstein's criterion, and if we check the degree, 5p is equal to p minus 1. For 5 sub 2p, same idea. Okay, here we have four factors. For the exponents, okay, 1 minus x to the 2p. Exponent is mu of 2p over 2p, so we get a 1. 1 minus x squared, the exponent is mu of 2p over 2, or mu of p, which is a minus 1, and so on. We reduce in stages, so I'll get 1 plus x to the p over 1 plus x. When we divide, we get the same polynomial as before, except with alternating signs. We check the degree, and 5, 2p is equal to p minus 1. For an example with a square in it, let's consider 5 sub 9. Here the factors are 1 minus x to the 9 and 1 minus x cubed. We note, for the factor 1 minus x, the exponent is mu of 9 over 1, or mu of 9, that has a square in it, so it's equal to 0. So that factor doesn't occur. When we divide, we get 1 plus x cubed plus x to the 6th. And to check the degree, we note that 5, 9 is equal to 3 squared minus 3, or 6. Final example, okay, I'll leave the work to you. We take 5 sub 24, okay, we have four factors. We reduce in stages, and we get 1 minus x to the 4th, plus x to the eighth. If we check the degree, 524 is equal to 5, 3 times 5, 8, and that's equal to 8, so that checks. Now, one thing you'll notice, coefficients on every polynomial that we've seen so far is either 0 or plus or minus 1. This is not always the case, but we won't see coefficients with absolute value bigger than 1 until we get to n equal to 105. Finally, let's return to the issue of the coefficients being integers. So here's another way to see this using formula 2. With formula 2, there are three things that can happen to each factor on the right-hand side. The exponent is 0, that factor doesn't occur in the product. If it's a 1, it's a polynomial with integer coefficients. And if it's a minus 1, we can rewrite it as a geometric power series. Okay, so like this. Okay, so note the coefficients here are either 0 or 1, and then we multiply by a minus 1. Now, this is a finite product. So on the right-hand side, I have a finite product of polynomials and geometric power series. On the left-hand side, I have a polynomial. So this makes sense in terms of formal power series. For analytic power series, it still makes sense, noting that our geometric power series will converge when the absolute value of x is less than 1. So that's another way to see that we have integer coefficients on the left-hand side.